Hi, Sharon. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm very good. Let me introduce us. I am Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are Sharon Salzberg, the pretty famous meditation teacher, I would say, and a co-founder of uh, Insight uh, Meditation Society mm -hmm. in Barrie, Massachusetts, which is a very important institution in the history of kind of American Buddhism, I would say. Um, and you are with us uh, largely because you've got this book that you've uh, co-authored with Robert Thurman, mm -hmm. very well-known scholar of Buddhism at Columbia, and it's called Love Your Enemies, um, How to Break the Anger Habit and Be a Whole Lot Happier. And Sharon, i got to say, if there's any, any injunction that qualifies for the term easier said than done, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Love Your Enemies. It's a oh great concept. I totally embrace the concept, okay? <laughs> But I don't think I've ever succeeded in doing it. It's but not easy. <laughs> no, it's not. And I'm and I and it helps your credibility that you're acknowledging that up front. But uh, but you do have some tips, I guess, some guidance on this subject, right? Well, I think for me, what was really important was was almost like a, a an investigation of like where's strength really found, where's happiness really found. You know, maybe we're taught and we believe that if we have endless thoughts of revenge, that we're going to be strong and, and vulnerable and happy. But when we really look, it's like, whoa, there's a lot going on there. And I'm so frightened and um, so obsessed with someone else's actions and things like that. So the possibility of, of kind of redoing our understanding is actually what inspires me about the topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it... it uh... Do you do people ever say to you, but but I'm sorry, it actually feels good to hate my enemies and, and like I'm not really killing them or anything. I never actually uh -huh. act out the fantasy, so who's that's who's good. Being hard? That's very good. Yeah, of uh, course people do say that quite a lot. And um you know, I think uh, actually not acting out the fantasies is a good step. Uh <laughs> not, you know, it's a very good step because we may not come that far, but we uh, you know, we could be, uh, not me too, you know, I've been there where I, I'm just like so caught up, I'm so consumed by someone else's faults and um, disagreeableness and what they've done and I can't let go of it. And so it's taking over so much of my own life energy and uh, I may not, you know, harm them physically, but I maybe talk about them or try to um, get other people to turn against them or I, you know, there's so many things that, that are just... Um, taking away from my own sense of integrity and dignity in the end. And uh, we don't need to go there. It's not that we have to give in. That's the big confusion. It's like, oh, that means giving in and being a doormat, and letting them act that way again, or saying it didn't matter. It does matter what people do, all of us. And actions are consequential. But we don't have to be so lost in that, in that kind of fixation. Mm -hmm. Now, uh... I know you teach you teach meditation retreats, and, 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 and one approach to this whole challenge can be pursued on a meditation retreat. In fact, there's a special type of meditation that we can talk about that's, uh, that's particularly focused on, on this called uh, meta-meditation. Um, and, and I want to talk about the meditative practice in general, but for people who don't meditate, are, are there... Um, are there are there things you know tips you can give them as a way to just start addressing uh, the problem, um, or or it, or do you think ultimately some sort of contemplative practice is just really integral to solving this problem? I think some sort of uh, introspection is probably integral to so solving the problem because else we don't want to. Mm -hmm. You know, we have that feeling. That's why it's a habit, right? It, there's a rush. And we feel strong. In Tibetan Buddhist teaching, they say that anger is what we pick up when we feel weak because we think it's going to make us strong. Mm -hmm. So if we actually look at the nature of anger, then we see within it this kind of helplessness, which we find unbearable. And we would rather do anything than just acknowledge, I feel this. But if we can bring ourselves to actually sit with it and acknowledge it, recognize it, then it's almost like the world opens up and we realize I might have options Mm -hmm. Other than, you know, writing that email, <laughs> you yeah. know, sending it to everyone in the world or, or whatever it might be. And, you know, when we're lost in anger, and I'm not talking about feeling anger, but when we're really lost in it, 
then we have very few options because mm -hmm. the world just collapses uh, around our, our pain. Yeah. Your point about weakness I, I does, I got to say, kind of make sense. Because when you think about it, um, I mean, if there's somebody who just doesn't threaten you at all, right, there's nothing they can do to you. They are not in a position to hurt you. You don't, mm -hmm. they're not especially highly thought of. They don't have a lot of stature, whatever. They don't have power. And if they hate you, you don't spend a lot of time worrying about that, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't feel weak relative to them. That's right. It's when, it's when someone actually seems at least to pose a threat uh, that, um, that, you do, that, that, you're, that you're more inclined to dwell on your, your hatred of them. Um, but, but I guess you might, you might say that the key thing there is seems to pose a threat, right? Well, I mean, some people seek our harm. I think that's very true. It's not just in our minds, but um, we, we can also look at causes and conditions like, um, you know, are there ways I can protect myself? Are there ways that I can protect somebody else? Are there ways I can try to change a system that's oppressive and, and harmful? But if I'm doing it from the space of anger and hatred, how effective is that really? Like in the Buddhist psychology, anger is likened to a forest fire which burns up its own support, which means it can devastate us. You know, so I'm not talking about just giving in and, and succumbing uh, to somebody's actions, but uh, we have to look at the cost of being lost in so much anger and outrage. And many activists tell me, for example, that they, I think, rightfully feel outrage at, at some tremendous injustice, but they don't know how to turn it off. And so mm -hmm. then the organization itself, which is seeking change, people are turning on one another and there's backbiting and there's maliciousness. And, um, you know, we need to be able to step back from that as well, not in the sense of resignation or apathy, but not to be in just that kind of heightened state all of the time. Okay. The um, let me, by the way, interject that that in the book you 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 take pains to say early on that that you're using the term enemies broadly. Mm -hmm. you, you are talking about overcoming your hatred of your enemies, your literal enemies, but there are also some some things you call enemies metaphorically, mm -hmm. uh, most of which are, are actually kind of related to in a way to the problem, the challenge of of not hating your enemies. But so you're talking, you know, your, your inner enemies, anger, hatred, and fear. Uh, you also talk about kind of self-absorption, self-preoccupation mm -hmm. as as a kind of enemy, and then self-loathing. So we'll we'll get to some of these, and they may um, enter the conversation um, kind of uh, naturally uh, as we pursue the subject. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you: you, you said uh, you don't necessarily have to meditate per se to start addressing the problem, but some, some introspection is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, is there kind of a fine line between those two? In other words, if you introspect in a productive way, maybe, maybe I guess I should ask you to describe in a more fine-grained way the kind of introspection you're talking about and, and say whether, whether doing it is almost a type of, you know, a, a kind of a flirtation with meditation <laughs> or something, you know? Well, I think it is, you're right. I think it is a, a kind of meditation in its own way. I meant that um, we need, I think we need to look at, say, the nature of anger um, and not just act. Well, mm -hmm. the first thing we need to do is know what we're feeling, which is actually uh, a crucial step. You know, there are many times I think we get irritated or um, annoyed and we don't even realize it and we go off to the computer and we type out the email and we press send and then maybe two hours later we go, whoops. I guess I said that with some hostility, didn't I? Maybe I'm not going to get what I want in the end. And so knowing what we're feeling, being in touch, is, is a kind of introspection. It's certainly a kind of meditation. Mm -hmm. And then realizing that um, we can take an interest in those feelings. Uh, if we look at anger, not the incident or the grievance, but actually the feeling, uh, we may see many layers, including that sense of helplessness. We may see sorrow or fear or um, grief or so many things may be interwoven in that mm -hmm. state. So then if we take action, it could be an action born of the comprehension of, of all of that. So I, of course, you know, just in my background, in my life, I've used meditation for that very thing. But I can imagine people outside of a formal meditative process might, might just have that tendency to look inside.
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's surprising how hard it is to learn from this particular mistake. I mean, you, you described sending an ill-advised email. It, it's like you'd think that you could say to yourself, you know, when, when like five minutes after sending it, you know it's a mistake. You'd think you could say, well, you know that feeling you had right before you sent the email? The kind of, yeah, feeling, you know, I'm going to send this email, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Never send an email when you're feeling that, right? You, you think, right. You, you'd think You'd think you could learn, but... It's not that, you know, it's in the nature of anger and rage to kind of capture your mind. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. what is it, uh, what it how, how does meditation address that problem? Or does meditation address that problem? Yeah, and I think meditation very specifically will address that problem because of the nature of training and mindfulness. Um, you know, it's not just when you're sitting on the cushion or couch or whatever in that formal period of maybe 20 minutes in the morning that you're really developing a skill that transfers into your life and so that's you know that's fantastic I'm mean, really in the end I think nobody meditates in order to become a great meditator we meditate to have a different life to have a different relationship to ourselves and to others to be aware rather than in that kind of you know half asleep state mm-hmm so uh, the idea is to, uh, well, to have, I guess you might not use the term detachment, to, but to be in the habit of having a little more distance from, mm -hmm. f from your mm -hmm. feelings in a way. Well, distance, I mean, the words are very hard, you know, mm -hmm. as you know, like distance can imply a kind of coldness or um, disconnection almost, but so sometimes we say spaciousness. Um, because you're not isolating yourself from the feeling. You're not disconnecting, but you're also not immersed. We talk about mindfulness, actually, as a balanced relationship to our experience. So we're neither lost in it, you know, completely overwhelmed by it, because then there's not enough space to learn. And we're also not rejecting it, hating it, and freaking out about it, because then we're, you know, we're too hostile to learn. So it's that place right in the middle where we're connected but we're not lost, that understanding can be born. Right. Okay. So there's a, there's a, there's a sense in which a kind of accepting attitude toward kind of regrettable mm -hmm. impulses actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Weak, weakens their grip on you. Right. That's right. Um, the, uh, so let's, um, let's do move on to, um, to some of the metaphorical enemies. I mean, some of them we've talked about, uh, already, uh, with, um, you know, anger naturally arises when you talk about, and hatred <laughs> naturally arises when you talk about, uh, enemies and, and fear we kind of touched on. I mean, is your premise that fear is always at some level involved when you, when you actually hate someone? I do think so, actually. Um, in the Buddhist psychology, anger and fear are actually the same mind state. They're just two different forms. Anger being the energized, outflowing, expressive form, and fear being the held in, frozen, and imploding form. Uh, but they're the same thing of, of wanting to strike out against what's happening, declare it to be untrue, mm -hmm. and to separate from it. And so that they're, they play off each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and with all of these feelings... Um, you know, we mentioned meta meditation, and that's uh, it's. I guess is it M E T T A, right? It's, right. it's a yeah. it's a Pali word mm -hmm. meaning loving kindness that shows uh -huh. up in in early Buddhist scriptures, um, and adorns the entrance of the Insight Meditation Society uh, very prominently. The word um, the uh, so that's a that's a specific type of meditation, and I have to confess. You know, I mean, as you know, I've been to some meditation retreats at IMS, and and uh, meta meditation I've always had trouble with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the maybe uh, maybe you should describe um, what you know how how it works. Well, I, I, first of all, you're not alone. A lot of people have trouble <laughs> uh, both with the word and um, with the idea of the technique. I think it does. It's a very delicate technique. It takes some time if one is mm -hmm. wanting to do it. But, you know, but of course, that's 
that's optional. I have a friend who, uh, my first book was called Loving Kindness, and I have a friend who's, I think in his 40s, and he told me he was reading it on the New York City subway, and he was so embarrassed to be seen reading a book called Loving Kindness <laughs> that he was like cleverly placing his finger over the title. And I thought, my God, it's like pornography or something. <laughs> and uh, We can have lots of feelings about the concept and the, the idea. The reality of it is that it's a technique that's based on training our attention. It's not, as many people fear, kind of trying to have a phony feeling or pretend you're feeling something you're not or being overly sentimental or something like that. Uh, the, I, the belief is that loving kindness and compassion follow attention. So, for example, think about the many beings we may look right through. You know, we overlook, we ignore. Check out person in the supermarket. Um, bank teller, dry cleaner, somebody like that, who we don't have that kind of sense that this is a human being who wants to be happy just as I do. Uh, they're an object in that moment. And so we create an other, not even through prejudice or antipathy, but just indifference. Mm -hmm. And so training ourselves to look at them, to listen rather than overlook them, Mm -hmm. is what elicits the sense of connection. So ultimately, loving kindness isn't a feeling like I love everybody and it's all wonderful, but it's a deep knowing of how connected we all are. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, it is kind of an interesting exercise in everyday life to try to make a point of looking at people you normally would not even notice, you know? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like, depending on where you are in your life, uh, you know, there's certain kinds of people like you're looking at. Okay. So like if, if like when I was a young male, I suppose I would be on the one hand looking at young women. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also look at young men often because they might, you know, to see if they're like in some sense threatening, you, you know, I don't mean physically threatening, yeah, but like, are they, are they the competition, you right. know, right. and you're not looking at older people. And you're not so anyway, but but all of us have the, these categories of people we pay attention to, and then these categories we're just right. not. That's it's right. like it's like my brother, my brother, my older brother said when he was uh, uh, maybe uh, actually a little younger than I am now, sadly. But he was talking about getting to the point where women no longer look at you, you know. And he said, you know, when you're walking down the street, and he said, it's not that they think you're bad looking; they just don't realize you exist. Um, and and that's you know, for all of us, there's a lot of people in that category. That's right. Um, and, and I found um, it's not hard to like them. I mean, precisely because you're not looking at, you know, because you, precisely because they're not in the category of automatic monitoring, they're not especially threatening people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess they're kind of a middle ground between the people, you know, you natural, you easily love your offspring and so on. And then your enemies at the other extreme. And, Mm -hmm. And in, in meditation, in meta meditation, as I recall, what you have, the teacher kind of guides you through the whole spectrum, right? You, you usually, you start, I don't know, you start with yourself, or you start with a family you, member. You start with yourself. And this is a question, actually, you, you know, you, you, self-loathing is one of the enemies you describe in your book, so we might as well talk about this a little, but... Uh, I always had trouble. Uh, maybe that's where I, I got off the boat with meta meditation. Is that they're, they're trying to get you to have all these warm feelings toward yourself at the beginning, and then you're going to move out from there and eventually get to your enemies and imagine an enemy and have warm feelings toward them. I always had trouble with the very beginning, the first step. Well, I, I also, um, at least when I teach it, I don't really focus on the idea of warm feelings, okay. but more... Um, an inclusivity of attention. Um, it's almost like a more truthful attention, like starting with oneself. Let's say you're in the habit at the end of the day of evaluating yourself, kind of like, how did I do today? And mm -hmm. let's say you're in the habit of pretty well only thinking about the mistakes you made and the thing you said unskillfully and the really stupid thing you said at lunch at the meeting. This is my life. You okay. just described my life. So much so that your whole sense of who you are and all that you will ever be collapses around that stupid thing you said at the meeting. So the, the invitation of loving kindness is almost like asking yourself, anything else happened today? Like any good within me? It's not saying, you know, wasn't that a brilliant, witty thing I said at lunch? Mm -hmm. Maybe it was really stupid. And there are consequences to that. But that's not all that we are ever. So it's that kind of fixation, the limitation 
only looking pretty well, only looking at what's negative. We just want to stretch. We want to include something bigger and also more true than that because we're not just that comment. So you, would, so, so you would say actually think about the day and think mm-hmm. about some things you did that were, you know, like I yeah. didn't run over anybody when I drove home, you know, <laughs> maybe something even more positive than that. But, um, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, and well, then, I mean, psychologists I hear say these days that a lot of research has been done saying one of the most healing things any of us can do at the end of the day is keep a gratitude journal. Like write down three things we're grateful for at the end of the day. And it's kind of similar, Mm -hmm. you know, and I always say, if you're going to do that, one of them can be that you're breathing. It doesn't have Mm -hmm. to be really grandiose, but I would say my personal conditioning and my cultural conditioning is such that I'm much more likely to come to the end of the day and think about everything that went wrong and what Mm -hmm. can I complain about and who was late and what about the airline? And then there's, you know, this and that and that. Um, So it's a stretch. That's what I mean by intentionality. Mm-hmm. But it's not phony, you know, which is the big problem is that people think, oh, I'm going to try to make believe that, you know, nothing made okay. me happier than when the airline lost my luggage or right. something like that. And it's really not that. So the exercise in the case of the meta meditation would be in a, in a way, I mean, very related to a gratitude journal, but almost the inverse in the sense that it's not what the world has done for right. you. It's things you've done for the world or you've done for somebody or you've That's done right. that are that are that are laudable. That's and, right. And so you would recommend during that phase of, of uh, meta meditation or just at the end of the day, uh, if you have a like a self-loathing problem, um, reflect on things you did that were upstanding or mm-hmm. laudable. OK, I'll work on that. I'm sure I, I'm it's sure that I, easy. <laughs> I'm sure I can think of something. Are we allowed to go back like 20, 30 years? Yes. OK, I can think of something then. I'm sure. Um, so then do you use the same technique in meta meditation as you move on? So then you, 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 you might think of a family member. You might think of somebody, well, somebody, like you said, a checkout, uh, clerk or something you, you have, who's not a friend, not an enemy. Um, and then eventually you get out to actual enemies. Uh, you also th- think at some point about people who have been benefactors of yours, I guess, who've done you some good. Um, but anyway, you go through the whole spectrum of people all the way to people, you kind of load. And, and do you, you recommend doing that in all of those cases, thinking, you know, mm-hmm. l- l- looking at things they have, uh, specific, and other specific things they may have done that are good? Well, you, it, with the checkout person in the supermarket, they may not be that. Mm-hmm. So, or, you know, <laughs> in a bad day, they may not be that even for yourself. <laughs> but um, it's the recognition that everybody wants to be happy that we actually all want a sense of belonging in this life. We want to feel like we're part of something greater than our limited sense of self, but we're so lost. We're so confused. We get so many messages about where happiness is to be found, even in the matter of anger. You know, are we really happier with these endless scenarios of revenge playing out? Or is there another way to find happiness that, that isn't, you know, just being weak or, or something like that? And so, We can remember even looking at a a very difficult person. Here's somebody who actually has that same urge toward happiness. And uh, it's out of ignorance that we do these tremendous things that can cause so much suffering for ourselves and and for someone else. But if you're really bold and audacious, um, you can see if you can find one good thing about them. You know, not to pretend that all the rest doesn't exist. Like when I went to Burma in 1985, to intensively practice metta meditation, that was one of the instructions. Think of you, see if you can find one good thing about even somebody you don't like. Mm -hmm. And my first thought was, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's what stupid people do. They go around looking for the good in people. I thought, I don't even like people like that. (laughs) But as I tell the story, it was very far from home. I was in a Burmese monastery. It's a very traditional culture. So the nature of the teacher-student relationship is not one where the teacher suggests you do something and you say, I don't feel like it. It's like you do it. So I did it and it was so interesting because it didn't make me like in a fog of delusion, like, oh, they're a perfect person. Um, But I I thought of somebody whose behavior I actually found quite irritating, I think in a very reasonable way. (laughs) And, And this memory came to me where I remembered him once I, I saw him, I was there when he did this beautiful thing for someone we both knew. He just did a very kind act, and he did it in the nicest possible way so she didn't feel demeaned or condescended to. And I mean, he just did it so well, so that memory came to me. And then I thought, 
I don't want to think about that. That complicates things. Right. I liked it better when he was all bad all the time, but life is complicated. We're all complicated. You know, we're not asking you to like somebody um, or take them home with you or give them all your money or anything, but just to have that deep sense that our lives have something to do with one another. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I should say, before I ask this question, that your book, um, it's co-authored in an unusual sense. In other words, uh, you know, there are parts of the book that you wrote that are in one typeface and parts that uh, Robert Thurman wrote which are in another mm-hmm. typeface, and they're kind of interspersed. Uh, and I think maybe this is in uh, what I'm about to ask is possibly in the Thurman part. I'm not, I, I, I don't remember exactly, but th- it's the idea that one source of compassion for your enemies um, can be reminding yourself of the way we're all kind of creatures of our past. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. we uh, right. We're all we're all in some sense. Uh, you know, our behavior is. I don't want to be too deterministic about it, but you know, we're born with certain genes. We have these life experiences, and we wind up doing certain things, and and. Uh, and that can be a source of compassion, right? Yeah, it is. I used to say that um, in meditation, actually, you can tell me, if we're, I think we're getting closer to this. I used to say that I wanted someone to invent a machine so that during a meditation session, we could plug in just one person and have their thoughts amplified to the rest of the room. <laughs> and uh, in the absence of that machine, uh, which would be very interesting, wouldn't it? It's like, You'd be sitting there thinking, wow, you looked so serene, but look what was going on. Um, In the absence of the machine, I actually don't think it takes that much introspection to see all the waves of feeling and urges and um, so much stuff arises in us. We may never act on it because of wisdom, background, training, sometimes sheer good luck. I bet most people could remember at least one time where you think, well, thank goodness I didn't go for it. I almost did that. Um... So it's not that it's saying what somebody else does doesn't matter, but you can kind of have some empathy about, ooh, I've been that lost, or I was mm-hmm. close to being that lost, or I've been that angry, or uh, felt that helpless and hopeless. And so um, it's really not, and this is, you know, I keep coming back to this because it's what's so hard. Uh, it's not saying it doesn't matter what we mm-hmm. do, but at all, but we can get a, a, a kind of an understanding like, oh yeah, I can get it. I can get why or how someone might do that. Yeah. It's like, I've noticed when you look at your own children on the playground, you're very aware. They might, you might see them do something mean and you can kind of see that they're doing it out of insecurity. You, but, but when somebody else does is mean to them, you're, you're not so inclined to that explanation, yeah, right. but, but that's your right. point is it's equally valid. Um, and you know, I should say that, you know, I had said meta meditation per se is never especially worked for me, but just Plato meditation of the kind you do mm-hmm. either at home or at a meditation retreat, in my experience, naturally has some of this effect. I mean, the, the closest I've come to triumph over hatred of an enemy was, was at a meditation retreat at IMS. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not, it wasn't meta meditation. Uh, although maybe I'd been influenced by hearing the meta meditation, but I thought of this person and suddenly he seemed so insecure, which he in fact uh, is, I, I, you know, That's and, safe. and you, and you, and suddenly I could see that that was the source of his, whatever, I won't get into him. Uh, but, um, and I could see that that was the way his parents might look at him or something, uh, you That's know, and, and, uh, so it's great when you can do it, <laughs> but uh, but it is hard. It's very hard, and, and we're inspired sometimes by the degree of our suffering. You know, if you're fine, then, you know, you're getting through the day. But if if you are kind of caught, then then you realize, ooh, I'm spending a lot of time. I mean, I, I, I often joke about in meditation how we go through the list of someone else's faults, and then we go through it again. And again, and again, same list, you know, we haven't thought of a new one. But it's like so much of our time, so much of our life energy is given over to this other person. We can't do anything about their faults anyway, you know. So it's just like, it's like being caught. And uh, it causes tremendous pain. And we also feel very lonely in the end because um, 
if we don't have the habit of gratitude, if we don't have the habit of feeling happiness for others, um, then more and more it seems like it's us against the world or me against the world. And uh, it's a very lonely place. Mm -hmm. The um, Now, there's a, there's a kind of another sense in which meditation um, can enter this, this challenge of, you know, kind of compassion for your enemies. And this is, I would say, at the deep, at the deep end of meditation, a, a, a part of it where I, that I don't think I've come very close to, uh, except maybe very fleetingly. And it has to do with this, the, the Buddhist conception of the self and, the, you know, the, an idea that it, when put in kind of extreme form, asserts that the self almost does not exist mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that this is an insight you can have with enough um, meditation that you can start to feel that way, that you can mm -hmm. start to feel that yourself was an illusion. Um, what, what can you say about the connection between that mm -hmm. and, and this, this mm -hmm. issue of, of enemies? Well, the, um, this also, of course, is extremely subtle, but it's not so much that the self doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in the way we think it exists, mm -hmm. which is independent, cut off, isolated, in charge, uh, you know, all those times, many, many times, sometimes many times a day, we think, I should be able to control this, uh, you know, because there's, there's a sense of um, control that, that we think we're entitled to as a separate self. Um, and so uh, it's more uh, an understanding, I think, that we live in an interconnected universe, that, of course, I'm distinct from you, and um, it's not that we kind of morph together in some soup, you know, um, but that the truth all along has been that we live in an interconnected universe. Like sometimes mm -hmm. uh, in sitting in a room with people, or we could do it now in, in some way, I ask people to reflect who all has had some effect on the fact that you're sitting here right now. Um, somebody gave you a book. Somebody read you a poem. Somebody mm -hmm. told you about this experience. You know, and people just bring to mind this it's really like this moment is this confluence of connections and relationships and interactions. And um, that's also true. And it's not something we often come to or, or think about. And so, you know, it's not that somebody was just in the case of the room walking down the street and looked in and thought, I'm going to go in there. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So we live as part of a network as well as an individual. And, and that's like the insight into interconnection and, and it's very much having to do with metta and loving kindness, even for one's enemy. It's, it's this understanding that our lives are connected. Mm -hmm. And the corollary of that is that everybody counts. Everybody matters. No one left out. Even if you don't like somebody, even if you're going to take strong action to try to prevent them from doing something again, people still have that, that sense of um, everybody's worth something in the end. Mm -hmm. And, and during meditation, <clears throat> I take it that can come to be more than just a kind of an abstract understanding, mm -hmm. an analytical understanding. It's it's almost sure. it's almost a feeling. Yeah, it is. It's like a visceral sense of um, maybe we look back at our past and we we just have a sense of this leading to that, to that, to that, to that, to that. And, uh, when I do that particular reflection, for example, um, about who all is involved in my being here in this room right now. Sometimes I think of the Board of Regents of the state of New York, which gave me a scholarship, which is how I was able to go to college. And it was when I was in college that I entered this independent study program, and that's how I got to India. So, you know, it's just like realizing that it's not like poof. Um, you know, I'm here. I'm here mm -hmm. because of causes and conditions and, and all of that. And, and we just we feel it. We sense it very strongly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your your whole India thing is pretty fascinating to me. <laughs> so, so I mean, you were uh, this was I don't know when in the in the seventies or something. Um, you 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 ventured off uh, in in seek of in search of I guess spiritual uh, guidance or something, um, and you came back as a result of that and founded the Insight Meditation Society. So I mean, in that sense. When I'm at a retreat at IMS, I should also thank the Board of Regents. <laughs> yes. That's right. You should. See? 
See how connected we are? It's very connected. Yeah. Um, that must have been a fascinating time, kind of total immersion in a, in a, in a kind of, that kind of spiritual milieu in, uh, in India. It was a fabulous time. Like, I was 18 when I went. I was a junior in college, and uh, it was this wave of people that were there. I met, um, actually, it was Dan Goleman who brought me to my first meditation retreat. Who's now known for having written, among other things, emotional intelligence. That's right. And um, he was, uh, I'd wandered around India uh, for a few months looking for something very precise, because I wasn't interested in philosophy. I wasn't interested in becoming a Buddhist. I wanted to know if there were some very practical, pragmatic tools I might use in in learning meditation that would actually make me be happier. And I couldn't quite find it. And I heard uh, Dan um, give a talk at this international yoga conference after I'd been there for a couple of months. And he mentioned he was on his way to this town, Bodh Gaya, which is the town that's grown up around the tree. They say the Buddha was sitting under when he became enlightened. And he was going to attend the 10-day meditation retreat which sounded just like what I was looking for. So I went, and it was just what I was looking for. It was fabulous, and it was there um, that I met Joseph Goldstein, and Ramdas was there, and so many people who are still my close friends. And, and you and Joseph were t became two of the three co-founders of the Insight Meditation Society. That's right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, let, me, um, let me ask you one more question about this self-loathing business. Um, the uh, first of all, it, it it is I gather. Well, well, first let me ask you, how what you seem to think it's pretty widespread, and in particular, you think there's probably um, more of it in say the United States than there is in Asia. Although you're mm -hmm. careful not to romanticize Asia, um, is is that really the case? I mean, it, uh, I, I'm curious because I I like I have a certain amount of it myself sometimes, but I. My friends, so far as I can tell, <laughs> kind of don't. And uh, do you think it's really widespread, or is it just the case that people who mm -hmm. suffer from it come to your attention because you're a, you're a teacher who talks about things like this? Or yeah. And do you think it's more common than it used to be in the United States, or what? Um, well, certainly. I mean, that's an interesting question, that uh, the people I tend to meet are the people who are uh, very sensitive to certain things. And you know, sometimes we joke and we say, like, all the wrong people loathe themselves, you know. <laughs> there are other people who might Isn't give that it a try, you know. Enemies, our enemies seem not to so far as we can tell, yeah. and they should. That's right, but, and probably they do. Yeah. Um, but it's masked, of course, by uh, this overbearing attitude um, sometimes. But, uh, of course, I'm, you know, I had a pretty famous encounter with the Dalai Lama some years ago. It was like 89 or 90. Uh, when I was at a, a very small conference with him in, in Dharamsala, where he lives in India. And I had the chance to ask him a question. So I said, Your Holiness, what do you think about self-hatred? And he said, what's that? And it was this really, he, he was like very puzzled. He said, is it some kind of nervous disorder? And, you know, and the, maybe there were 20 other people in the room and everyone's saying, no, it's this and that. Uh, it, it was really very interesting. He was He was very confused and by it. And he said, in the end, how can you think of yourself that way? You have Buddha nature. Hmm. And that, I think, is the fundamental difference, is that belief that, and again, I don't want to romanticize Asian culture at all, but it, there's like a, a rock bottom sense that underneath everything, the habits and the fears and the behavior, is a capacity for freedom. And uh, it may be covered over, it usually is, and it may be obscured, it may be hard to find, it may be hard to trust, but it's there. So if you go to the deepest level of your being, you see this possibility for freedom, whereas that's not how we think of ourselves. And so it, it's different, I think. Now, is that how you would define Buddha nature? It's a term you hear a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, is, it a, mm -hmm. is it, you'd call it a capacity for mm -hmm. freedom? Mm -hmm. It's a capacity for freedom, for connection, for boundless compassion, for, for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Because his whole idea is we suffer because we are deluded about mm -hmm. the nature of things. And, um, and to, to, to cease to be deluded is to be liberated. And that's where the potential lies. That's right. So well, that's great. That, that brings us back to mindfulness because you don't have to uh, 
try to like reform yourself. You just have to see very, very clearly how things are. It is a challenge though. Yes. Uh, and I mean, you know, uh, and, and I'm, and I'm, you know, kind of a believer myself in, in the, in, in, uh, that it's true. We are naturally deluded and that, uh, meditation is a way of, uh, of beginning to lose the delusion, mm -hmm. uh, but you know you you, and some people have an easier time of it than others. But for me, you go to a meditation retreat and you spend the first couple of days reminding your being reminded of how hard it is mm -hmm. to um, to distance your well, whatever term you want to use to to distance yourselves I, uh, yourself. I guess I would say from the the thoughts and feelings that are part of the uh, delusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, it's that's what's amazing to me. It's, it's hard, it's challenging, and it's possible. And there are methods. I'm a great believer in method. Um, there's a path, there's a way. And so uh, what's especially hard for us is not just thinking oh, happily that there's a path, you know, but it's, it's actually saying, okay, how might I do something right now or today? Um, you know, rather than thinking, well, great for the Buddha, you know, sitting under a tree 2,600 years ago in India. It's too bad I live in Manhattan. It's so noisy. Or, you know, if only this was different, then I could actually start. But we can start. We can do it right now. Yeah, and in fact, noise can come to seem beautiful. That's uh, right. It, it actually can. And, and this sounds like one of those things I would have laughed at years and years ago. But uh, at, a, at a meditation retreat at IMS, when they were doing construction, and there was all this construction noise, you can actually reframe it in a way that makes it uh, really like music. Yeah, you can. And uh, reframing is a great term for, for what we're doing because it's not reframing just to you know, feel nice and, and be sentimental, but because sometimes that original frame is so loaded with um, hope and fear and preconception and assumption that releasing the grip of some of that brings us to... Uh, a really much more open way of seeing. Yeah. And, and this is, this is kind of the idea that, that I, I mean, at some level, it sounds like a cliche, you know, it, it's all, it's all a question of how you look at it, you know, and how you think of things and, and, and how you frame them. It's the kind of thing that maybe you heard as a kid from your parents or something, but um, the actual doing of it in a really extensive way is first of all challenging, takes work, um, but secondly, it, it's amazing how um, how dramatically true it can turn out to be. That yeah, that you can true. really, uh, you know, not that I manage to do it on an ongoing basis. But one great thing about these uh, about a retreat is you get a sense for the potential for how far you could go in principle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but enough about me. Anything else you want to say about your book? Love your enemies. Uh, it is in, it is written as you say in an unusual way. Um, I never had a co-author before, so that was an adventure. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob, you know, is is a great scholar, as you said, and um, so it was a, a wonderful like platform for me to play off of. And uh, part of the reason it ended up the way it did was because as I we wrote separately, and as I pondered enemy. And the concept of enemy, it really uh, was so much more than a person and their actions. You know, the way we can make death into an enemy, certainly mm -hmm. in this culture, or suffering into an enemy. Uh, it's wrong. I shouldn't feel that. I should be like chipper all the time. and um, Everything should be perfect. And uh, time can seem like an enemy and change and so many things. And so I just wrote uh as I want to do rather than stay within an outline. And so in the end, the publisher had the not enviable task of trying to put the two halves together. And, and they came up with, I think, a pretty good way. It is a good idea. There's a, there's a nice rhythm between the two voices. Thank you. Um, and he's from a, he's focused on a different tradition, more Tibetan, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but uh, still at the, at, at a, you know, at a deep level, the teachings, are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you, Sharon, so much for uh, taking the time from your new your new apartment. Yes, thank you. In uh, <laughs> in New York, uh, and uh, um, 
And here again is the book, Love Your Enemies, not just the obvious kind, but uh, some metaphorical kinds, uh, including self-loathing, self-absorption, and so on. So, so good luck with the chair, and I hope you'll, you'll come back and talk to us uh, when you write the next book, if not sooner. Oh, the next book's coming out January 1st, so we'll, we'll, if you invite I, me, I'll come. I hope to still be here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.